Let us pray. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be praised. My Redeemer, you are worthy to be praised. Father, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be glorified. Because there's no one like you. You are the Almighty. You are the Most High. All power belongs to you. You can do and undo. It's the one that will kill that will die. The one you choose to keep alive, nobody can kill. We worship you. We thank you for January. We thank you for February. We thank you for March. We thank you for April. We thank you for May. We thank you for June. We thank you for July. We thank you for August. We thank you especially for our past convention. Thank you for bringing us to September. Father, please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Ancient of days, as your children are gathering all over the world to thank you today, please accept our thanks. Do something special. Do something great. We have come to worship you, my Father and my God. Please be present in our midst. And everything that will cause us to rejoice, even for the rest of the year, my Father and my God, give to us today. Amen. As for your children who have been faithful over the years, in their offerings and in their tithes, this month in particular, surprise them all. Amen. Bless them beyond their widest imaginations. Amen. Show them that you are the almighty God Amen. and that you are the all-sufficient God. Please, Lord, before the end of the service today, let your children have cause to shout hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Well, let someone shout hallelujah. hallelujah. We will continue our discussions on the wonders of God. Like I told you, we couldn't finish everything about the wonders of God during the convention. As a matter of fact, it's impossible to exhaust all the wonderful things about our God. But today we want to talk about the wonders of his worship. I know that this is a Thanksgiving Sunday. The sermon is supposed to be brief so that we can have plenty of time to rejoice and praise him. But I believe that the wonders of his worship is so important that I'm going to take my time. This is likely to be a Bible study. And you will see the reason why before we finish. John chapter 4, from verse 19 to 24. John 4, from verse 19 to 24. The woman said unto him, this is a Samaritan woman that came to fetch water and met Jesus Christ there, and they were talking. 
The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I feel led of the Holy Spirit to take my time this morning, like I said, and talk to you about the wonders of his worship. You see, basically speaking, there are seven ways that a human being can relate to God verbally. Seven ways. Number one, you can relate to God by murmuring, by complaining, by telling him Why are you like this to me? Exodus chapter 16 from verse 9 to 20. Exodus 16 from verse 9 to 20 tells us that after God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, took them through the Red Sea, thus having performed all manners of miracles in Egypt, to compel Pharaoh to let them go. All of a sudden, they began to complain. They began to murmur. Oh, we remember when we were in Egypt, when we had plenty of food to eat. Now he has brought us into this wilderness to kill us with hunger. Murmuring is you complaining about God, forgetting what he had done for you in the past. Nobody likes that kind of attitude. And when you murmur against God, he hears you. And he could be pretty angry if a mama. In First Corinthians chapter ten, verse ten, First Corinthians chapter ten, verse ten, the Bible warns don't you ever mama against God. Because those who did in the past were destroyed. You murmur if you forget all that God had done for you. You think he hasn't done enough. Please consider what he had done. Several years ago, I visited Egypt for the first time. I was invited to come and preach. And the man who invited me that was before we started our church there. Took me around. And he said, one place I must visit. I don't know if the place is still there or they've done something about it. It's a place called the City of the Dead. I, I, I was eager to see. 
And he took me to the place where they buried all those who died during the, I think, during the Second World War. Massive place. Graves upon graves upon graves. And over the graves, there no, I'm not talking of now. I don't know what the situation is now. There are little, little tents made from uh, some plastic materials. He said to me, what you see there are accommodation for some people. That once a year, when relatives of those who are buried there want to come uh, to visit their relatives, they will pack their little tent and move out of the way in the morning so that the relatives can come. As soon as the relatives have gone, they are back, sleeping on the slabs over the graves. That day, I thank God that I might be living in just one room in Moshe, which is where I was living at that time. But at least, thing. if the mother of Judas Iscariot had known what his son would become, she would have been glad if that fellow died at childbirth. So don't think God doesn't know what he's doing. He knows. Number three. You can ask him a question. Now, there's a difference between a question and a query. A question is something that you ask when you want to know. You just need information. I mean, <laughs> when I was a very young Christian, I had questions coming from the background of a mathematician. Oh my, I had questions, but they were not queries. I had questions to ask God that I dare not even ask my pastors. If I had asked them, they probably would have thrown me out of the church. But God knew this is a boy who wants to know more about me. So when I asked him the questions, he generously gave me the answers. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 2, from verse 9 to 15, 2 Kings chapter 2, from verse 9 to 15, after Elijah disappeared and dropped his mantle, Elisha picked the mantle, rolled it together, went to River Jordan, smote the River Jordan, and asked, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He wanted to know. It's a question, not a query. He wanted to know, will you, the God of my father, be my father? Will you answer me like you answered my father? That was a legitimate question. That's not a query. And God, of course, answered him to say, <laughs> Boy, I'm here. From time to time, you may ask God, God, where are you? <laughs> I used to laugh when I was very young, when I, my mother would look up to heaven and say, God, I don't know where your face is. <laughs> I didn't understand what she was talking about. You want to see his face and you are looking to heaven? What direction should you look? Elijah said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he answered, I'm still on my throne. I'm still in charge. As I was with your father, so will I be with you. If you ask him a question because you wanted to know, he will answer. Number four, 
is that when you can call on him. That's what many of us call prayer. And he says it's okay to call on him. In Jeremiah 33 verse 3, Jeremiah 33 verse 3, he says, call on me and I will answer you. He encouraged calling. Particularly when you need help. Matthew chapter 40, for instance, from verse 23 to 33. Matthew 14, 23 to 33. When Jesus told the disciples to go to the other side, that he would join them, and he went to the mountain to pray. And by the time he came down from the mountain, all the boats had left. And he decided to fulfill his promise. The only thing to do now is to walk on water. To go and join the disciples. And then they were in a storm. You know the story. And they saw him walking towards them. They thought it must be a spirit. And he told them, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you. And the Lord said, come. And he stepped out of the boat and began to walk towards Jesus Christ. But then when the Bible said when he saw the wind boisterous, when, when all of a sudden he saw the wind blowing, he saw the storm, <laughs> he said, what have I done? Peter, who are you to be walking on water? And then he began to sink. He called for help. Anytime you cry to God for help, he will help you. Number five. You can relate to God through thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse 4. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, You should enter his gate with thanksgiving in your heart. What is thanksgiving? That's when you are relating to God, considering what he had done for you. When you are showing him appreciation for what he had done for you as an individual. Luke chapter 17, from verse 12 to 19. Luke 17 from verse 12 to 19. The Bible tells us that the Lord healed ten lepers who had called for help. And one came back to show his appreciation, thanksgiving. And the Lord appreciated what he had done and disapproved of the nine others who didn't come back to say thank you. Thanksgiving is very, very acceptable to God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, don't ever enter his gate without thanksgiving in your heart. And then, of course, number six is praise. Oh, is praise different from thanksgiving? Oh, yes, it is. Praise is what you give to him for his achievements. For what he has done, not necessarily for you, but what he has done, generally, his achievements. You know, Psalm 100 verse 4, Psalm 100 verse 4 says, You enter his gates with thanksgiving, but as you get closer to him, as you enter his courts, now you switch to praise. 
In Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, Exodus 15, verse 1, when the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea, the Bible said Moses sang a song. And what was the beginning of the singing, he said, Ah, our God has triumphed gloriously. The horses and the riders, he had drowned in the sea. Now he's talking about the achievement of the Most High God. And God loves praise. He appreciates thanksgiving. He loves praise. Psalm 50 verse 23. Psalm 50 verse 23. He says, He that offereth praise glorifies me. But then, the highest of it all is worship. That's number seven. Worship. So we started from murmuring, complaining. We moved to query, and then to question. And things begin to get better. We move from question to prayer, and then to thanksgiving, and then to praise. And finally, worship. You see, worship is so crucial to God that we find in the text we read, John 4, if you read from verse 23 to 24 there, that God himself looks for worshippers. He seeks them out. Thankers, those who thank him, are good. Praisers, those who offer praise, they glorify him, but he's seeking for worshippers. Now, what is worship? Worship is not thanking him for what he has done for you. Worship is not thanking him for his achievements. Worship is telling him who he is. Who he is. Jesus told the woman, he said, hey, you don't even know who you are worshiping. But we know who we worship. The question this morning is, do you know who you are worshipping? And this way I'm going to spend some time. So that the next time you worship God, you will know who you are worshipping. I want to remind you who you are worshipping. That's why when uh, our children, get, the, the, the choir get together, they want to do what we call praise and worship. You will find that when they are singing choruses and we are singing and dancing, that's praise. If it gets to real worship, <laughs> if you really, really get to real worship, then God himself will draw near. And if he draws near you, you know what? Your head will swell. You have never been in a place of true worship without getting very close to tears. Because he himself, the Almighty himself, will come near. And you saw the scriptures? Even when an angel passes by you, your hair will stand up. The hair on your head. Not to talk of when the Almighty Himself draws near. Tell Him who He is. Let me help you a little. Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. 
That was the first time God introduced himself. And he called himself the all-sufficient one. Hey, you cannot be remembering the fact that you are dealing with the all-sufficient one and be able to complain. It's not possible. You cannot be in the presence of the all-sufficient one and have queries. <laughs> You're dealing with the all-sufficient one. The one who is more than sufficient. Let me continue because of time. Who is he? Psalm 91 verse 1. Psalm 91 verse 1 calls him the most high. The one who is higher than the highest. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 8. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 8. The one who says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. You know, in my tribe, when they, when they begin to eulogize the king, the traditional ruler, they call him names that they don't call ordinary people. But here is the king of kings himself. Here is the lord of lords himself. Here is the one whose throne is higher than all the thrones in the world. Here is the one who can sit down in heaven and lock down the whole world. Here is the one who is so mighty that he can reduce all the science of the world to nothing. How I wish the world would know who is my God. If there's anything at all that this pandemic had that, should, that it should teach everybody is that the highest wisdom of man is still foolishness with God. The highest wisdom is still foolishness with God. I wish that we will learn that lesson and learn it very quickly. The one who, according to Daniel chapter 4, verse 25, Daniel 4, verse 25, the one who is called the Most High, who rules in the affairs of men, the one who decides who will rule. <laughs> in my native tongue, they call him the, the, the real kingmaker. The one who makes a king a king. Uh, if, he, if you say you're a king, you own your throne to his pleasure. Who is he? Psalm 24, verse 7. Psalm 24, verse 7 calls him the king of glory. What does that mean? Well, glory is the opposite of shame. And so when you call him the king of glory, you are talking about the one who has the ability, one, to remove shame. In 2 Kings chapter 5 from verse 1 to 14, 2 Kings 5 from verse 1 to 14, the Bible describes Naaman. In very glorious times. And put a bot on him. But he was a leper. With all his achievements. With all his wealth. With all his fame. He was a leper. I'm yet to find a king. I'm yet to find a president. I'm yet to find a head of state. Without a bot. 
except my king, the king of glory himself. Not only can he remove shame, he can even turn shame to glory. <laughs> I mean, you know what he did to Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar at that time was practically the king of the world. He misbehaved to the one who controls the affairs of kings. And my father asked him to go and eat grass like an animal for seven years. But when he realized who is the one ruling the affairs of men, God restored him. He said, majesty, glory was even added to me. He's the one who can change shame to glory. John chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11. John 2, 1 to 11. In the wedding in Canaan of Galilee, they ran out of wine. And the beautiful wedding was going to end up in shame. But the king of glory was there. And what would have been their shame became their testimony. Oh, people used to bring out the best wine, but your own wedding is unique. You kept the best wine till the last. They didn't know they were drinking water that had been uh, interfered with by the king of glory. We see that we are worshiping Psalm 24, verse 10. Psalm 24, verse 10 calls him the Lord of hosts. In Exodus 15, verse 4, Exodus 15, verse 4, Moses called him the man of war. <laughs> He's not a civilian. Oh, he's very gentle. He's very kind. He's love. He's rich in mercy. But don't you ever mess with him. Because he's a lord of hosts. He's a man of war. He's the original general. Oh, you don't believe me. Read Numbers chapter 16 from verse 23 to 34. Numbers 16, 23 to 34. Some people mess with him. They mess with his servant. He caused them to be buried alive. Because the biggest problem of any general, ask them, is what do I do with the dead bodies of the enemies? Because it's a very unpleasant work to bury your enemies, to bury their bodies. And if you don't bury their dead bodies, they will stink and cause a plague. So you have to do. So in the case of my father, the Lord of hosts, he does the whole thing at the same time. Just has the ground to open his mouth, just swallow these people. So we won't have to bother us burying them. He is the original admiral. You don't believe me? Read Exodus chapter 14. Read it from verse 15 to 28. Exodus 14, 15 to 28. When he drowned Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, the idea was that there would be no need to bother about burial. The fish would do the job. You don't believe me? He was the first one to manufacture a submarine. <laughs> hey, if you think that's a lie, when we get to heaven, ask Jonah. He will tell you this. We are talking about this Lord of hosts who spoke to a fish and said, swallow this man. Keep him inside. Don't digest him. Just keep him there safe for three days. And then uh, when God wanted to get him back to land, he said to the fish, he can't swim. So I want you to take him to the beach before you vomit him. 
That's my God. He's the original air marshal. He's the first one to throw bombs. You don't believe? Read Joshua chapter 10 from verse 1 to 11. Joshua 10 from verse 1 to 11. The Bible tells us that the people that were slain by the bombs that God rained down were far, far more than those killed by Joshua with his sword. Now, he's the Lord of hosts. I used to think that that means that he's the Lord of all the angels. Until God showed me, no, 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 no. The angels are one host, the heavenly host. And all the soldiers on earth are the earthly host. And then all the demons are the demonic host. He controls them all. All of them. He sends demons on errands. You don't believe me? Ask King Saul. First Samuel chapter 16. Verse 14. First Samuel 16 verse 14. The moment the Spirit of God departed from King Saul, an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. The devil went to him and began to talk about uh, uh, Job. Say, uh, is Job serving God uh, for not? He said, because we have made a hedge around him. I couldn't touch him. No demon can touch you without getting permission from God. And God told the devil, you can do this to him, but don't touch his life. <laughs> he told the devil, this is how far you can go. You can go beyond that limit. I am your maker. I am your controller. Oh, there are some people who say, well, in that case, if God can send the devil to torment Job, then maybe he will send the devil to torment uh, Christian. No, 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 no. Job was a servant. We are children. Nobody performs experiments with his children. Oh, several years ago when I was living in Moshi and some robbers were terrorizing our street and, uh, <laughs> and the policemen don't want to go to Moshi in those days. Those of us in the street agreed that we will get together what we call the vigilante. That we will all uh, assemble a little army of our own. Of the army assembled, not one was a child of the people who assembled the army. Servants. House helps. <laughs> Drivers. Other people. Everybody kept their own children at home. The vigilantes were servants. God is not going to use you as a vigilante against the devil. You are his children. The Bible says he will keep you like the apple of his own eyes. Because he controls all the hosts in heaven, on earth, underneath the earth. He is a Lord of hosts. And you know what? It's also called the consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Hebrews 12, verse 29. Says our God is a consuming fire. Now, some, some of us feel, why should I worship a consuming fire? Well, you can worship him as long as you don't misbehave yourself. <laughs> uh, if he loves you, he will tell you there are lines you don't cross. You know, 
when, Mo when Moses was singing in Exodus chapter uh, 15, he said, God is glorious in holiness and fearful in praises. Even when you are praising him, you will still remember. <laughs> it's also the consuming fire. But you see, the beauty of the consuming fire is that if it surrounds you, the enemy that tries to come near you will be consumed. That's one of the beauties. The second beauty of it is that it is, this kind, is the kind of fire that can consume anything. First King chapter 18, from verse 36 to 39. First King 18, from verse 36 to 39. When the fire of God fell on Mount Carmel, it consumed not just the offering, not just the wood, it consumed the rock, which is a symbol of hardship. It consumed the water, which is a symbol of sorrow, tears. It consumed dust, which is a symbol of sickness and disease. He is the consuming fire. And then, of course, it's called the Lion of Judah. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Revelation 5, verse 5. It's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. That is why when they threw Daniel into the den of lions in Daniel chapter 6, from the beginning to the end, he was able to tell the other lions, I am the original lion. <laughs> I know the other lions kept quiet. So let me, let me round up, because we've spent almost... An hour now. The greatest thing you need to know about him in worshiping him is that he gave his own name as the I am that I am. When he was introducing himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, you can read from verse 11 to 15. He said, I am the I am that I am. What does that mean? So many things. Number one, it means I am not I was. I am not an ex-king. I am not I will be. I, whatever promises I'm making, it doesn't mean that when you vote me into power, I will do it for you. No, no, no. I am now. What I am today is what I'm going to be tomorrow because by tomorrow, tomorrow will become today. I'm always I am. But that's not all because it brings us to the biggest beauty of it all. I am that I am simply means whatever you call me. That's what I will be to you. You call me the Most High, I will be the Most High to you. You call me the Almighty, I will be the Almighty to you. You call me the Lord of hosts, then you, <laughs> you are handing over your battles to me. You call me the consuming fire, then you can go to bed at night, knowing fully well that there's a wall of fire around about you that no witch, no wizard can fly through. Whatever you call me, that's what I will be to you. That's why today, when you want to worship him, please do it thoroughly. As much of his names as you can remember, as many of them as you can remember, call him by that name and watch him act for you. Thank him for what he's done for you. Praise him for all his achievements. But more than anything else, worship him. Call him who he is. As for those of you who are yet to surrender your life to him, you can only call him my father after you have given your life to him. You can only call him my God 
when you have surrendered to him. You can only call him my Lord when you've made up your mind that for the rest of your life, whatever he asks you to do is what you will do. But if you call him my Savior today, he will save your soul. So before we go to worship him, let's give an opportunity to those of you who will want to come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I have believed before that you are a good man. Now I know that you are not an ordinary man. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. I've heard about you that you are a good teacher. Now I know that you are not just an ordinary teacher. You are the word. You are the truth. You are the way. I come to you now. Please take over my life. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Those of you who want to give your life to Jesus Christ, call him my Savior. He will save you. Call him my Lord. He will become your Lord. Call him my King. And he will take over your life and begin to arrange things. Oh, thank you, Father. Call on him and say, please save my soul. Let your blood wash away my sins. Take over my life and I will serve you for the rest of my life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Ancient of days, the unchangeable changer, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the I am that I am. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you for your word. And thank you for those who have decided that from this moment onward they want you to be their savior. Please save their souls. Forgive all their sins. Write their names in the book of life. Receive them into the family of God. And from now on, whenever they call you, please answer them by fire. As for your children, as they begin to worship you today, worshiping you now, not just in spirit, but in truth, telling you who you are, my Father and my God, manifest your glory. Amen. Let every one of them go home today with a new, a mighty collection of miracles, signs, and wonders in Jesus' name. Amen. And please, Lord, as they worship you, draw near them. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Make sure you spend quality time worshiping him today, and you can be sure you will not regret it. God bless you all.